Today is the second of the three part series uh, that we began last week. Last uh, last week we basically tried to historicize the question or to examine the historical explanations for why it is that the continent finds itself where it is today. And we did at least try to make the point that Africa finds itself in what we may call a development impasse. It has reached a cul-de-sac, so to say. And so we try to historicize Africa's journey into that cul-de-sac. How did Africa find itself in that development cul-de-sac, so to say. What we are going to try and do today is to continue, because ultimately, like we said last week, ultimately the intent is to answer the question or to provide an answer to the riddle as to how does the continent get out of this cul-de-sac. And we thought that rushing down to answer that question might not be helpful without first understanding how did we get there, but also this cul-de-sac. What is the character of this cul-de-sac? What is it made of? Because you might not be able to get out of it if you do not understand it, the nature of the trappings that it has you know, encircled the continent with. So what we're going to try and do today is to examine closely the question as to what are the empirical and conceptual failures of previous development models in Africa. Surely, if Africa finds itself at a crossroad, so to say, in terms of development, it must be that the continent has indeed attempted hitherto to get itself out of this cul-de-sac or to get out of you know, the, the present you know, trappings of underdevelopment, quote and unquote. So we're going to try and answer the question or examine, as I've said closely, you know, the, 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 the riddle. What have been the empirical and conceptual failures of the development models previously attempted in Africa. So that is what is going to preoccupy us today. But I do have to just recap, I see that many of the faces were present last week, but you know, I'm going to recap just briefly what we did or what were the salient points in our discussion last week and for the benefit of those who may be attending for the first time, but also in order to remind and refresh our memories, those of us who were present last week. So as I've said, last week we tried to historicize this impasse, so to say. We tried to answer the question, how did we get here? And when I say, how did we get here? Of course, I mean, how did the continent get to the present cul-de-sac, you know, so to say. In answering that question, we looked at two paradigmatic explanations, viewpoints, if you wish, that attempt to answer that question. And both of those paradigmatic explanations locate the problem within colonialism. The radical political economy school or explanation of course, places emphasis on economic or material explanations. On the other hand, you know, the second viewpoint or paradigmatic explanation we said focused more on sociocultural and socio and psychosocial, you know, factors. Now, both of these paradigmatic explanations we said fall short in their appreciation of what colonialism is. Now, the importance of understanding colonialism appropriately lies in the fact that both of these paradigmatic explanations are convinced that the sources of the problem are to be found in colonialism. Now, if the sources of the problem are to be found in colonialism, it means that to get out of the problem, we must appreciate thoroughly 
what colonialism is. What we tried to suggest last week was the fact that both of these paradigmatic explanations or these viewpoints actually fall short in their appreciation of colonialism because they understand colonialism as an event, as something that has a start date and an end date. And we did say that if we think in disciplined terms, their problem is that they study colonialism using the historiographic method. Now, historiography, we said, is a method of studying history that places accent on events and dates. That's the method of studying history called historiography, which both of these paradigmatic explanations that we looked at seem to follow in their conceptualization or in their understanding of colonialism because they both think of colonialism as having started or begun in 1884 and ended in 1960. So they think of it as an event that has a start date and an end date. Now in place of that historiographic understanding of colonialism, we tried to suggest an alternative way of understanding colonialism as an epoch. And that understanding of colonialism as an epoch, we said, is drawn from a Nigerian sociologist named Peter Eke, who propounded this proposition of colonialism as an epoch in his inaugural lecture delivered at Ibadan University in 1980. And the lecture is titled Colonialism and Social Structure. Very important. So if we are to understand colonialism not as an event with a start and an end date and to understand it as an epoch, what would that mean? We followed, we tried last week to follow Peter Eke down the path as he explains what would it mean to understand colonialism as an epoch. Now he says, colonialism must be understood as an epoch alongside other comparative epochs or epochal movements. In fact, to be precise, he says, colonialism is an epochal move, is a social movement of epochal dimension and scale comparable to other social movements that are epochal. And what are these other social movements that he compares colonialism to? It is the Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution. And so he says colonialism is an epochal movement. And an epochal movement is basically a social movement whose supra-individual effects far outlive the time and space of their occurrence. Basically, any social movement that is of epochal dimensions is one whose supra-individual effects far outlive the time and space of their occurrence, which is simply to say that an epochal movement may happen here today, may happen at, 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 at Chicago today, but its effects are felt beyond Chicago, but they are also felt beyond 2024. They far outlive the time and space of their occurrence. And of course, their effects are often worldwide. They are not just spatiotemporally, or rather they are not you know, spatially limited the effects of any social movement are not spatially limited, but they are felt the world over. <clears throat> Equally important is the fact that social movements of epochal dimensions have effects that are supra-individual, which is to say that they are not dependent on individuals. 
They are supra individual. They are dependent on structure rather than on individuals. It is the structure that ensures the reproduction or even the production of a social movement of epochal dimension. It is not individuals. It's not dependent on individuals and its effects are supra individual. We did also say that for Peter Ecke, if we then understand colonialism as an epochal movement, we must think of it as having the same effect as other epochal movements. And we did say, of course, as we've just said now, that he thinks of the industrial revolution and the, in, and the French revolution as two comparable cases. Now, all epochal movements, according to Peter Eke, have the same effects. All epochal movements are totalizing, which is to say that they do not allow people a possibility of opting in or out of them. So we do not have, when epochal movements have occurred, we do not have an option of being left out of their effects or of participating. So we can't opt in or out of them once they have occurred. Their effects are totalizing. Two, all epochs, be it the Industrial Revolution, be it colonialism, be it you know, um, the French Revolution, they integrate the parts of the world that they touch into a hierarchical world system. So you can think of the Industrial Revolution. It integrates the world all parts of the world into a hierarchical international economic system. You either are integrated into the international economic system as an underdeveloped country or as a developed country as a result of the industrial revolution, which creates this modern international economic system that exists today. Of course, last week we did also say that the tragedy for us as the continent is that we were integrated into this international economic system. There was an apportioning of roles or an assignation of roles in this international economic system that left us as the continent as providers of primary commodities, including labor. Walter Rodney, we said, you know, basically says that we were integrated into this international economic system as hewers of wood and drawers of water. So international, or rather, all social movements are totalizing. They don't allow people to opt in or opt out. Two, they integrate, let's call them victims, those who get affected by them into a hierarchical international economic system. Three, Inter or rather social move or rather epochal movements are like a tidal wave. Once they have swept over the place and went back like a wave, nothing remains the same thereafter. So there is nothing that can claim to remain original once a social movement has occurred. We tried to demonstrate this by saying colonialism in Africa happened. If we understand it as a social movement, it means that there is nothing we can claim in the continent. And this is true. There's nothing in the continent we can claim to be autochthonous or to be originally okay. as it had been prior to colonialism. There's not a single thing that we can claim distinguishes pre-colonial Africa today, because social movements are tied up. Wherever they have swept, nothing remains the same. I did challenge you last week, and I will do so again today. If you can think of anything whilst I'm speaking that existed in Africa prior to colonialism, 
that still exist as it had been prior to colonialism today, raise your hand and I will allow you to tell us what it is exactly that remains as exactly it had been prior to colonialism. So, as we said, there is no traditional Africa. There is no pre-colonial Africa that remains virgin of foreign intrusion as a result of the tidal nature of colonialism. So I won't give you the example I gave you last week. I'm sure you remember. I gave you the example of, you know, <laughs> artworks or the artifacts. Take the Bini artifacts or any other that have a long history. Indeed, they existed prior to colonialism, but once colonialism happened, their meaning changed. They actually acquired the meaning we have of them today out of colonialism. What are they today? They are artifacts to circulate in the international art circuits. So they go into museums, they go into exhibitions, they go into you know, all those. And the language with which we speak about them today is the language borrowed from colonialism. We ask who has provenance over them. All of those things are things given to us, that meaning that we now, or rather those signs that we use to make sense of them is given to us by colonialism. So that is what Peter Eke means when he says that colonialism is a social movement whose tidal effects leave nothing unchanged. The last point um, to recap from last week is the fact that we didn't quite get to this point. Um, Peter Eke then ends his inaugural lecture by saying that what social movements do, what social movements of epochal dimensions do is that they impose a new order. They impose a new order over the environment, which is to say they domesticate the environment and the whole environment now becomes knowable on the basis of this order that they impose. What does it mean? Sounds abstract. Simple. Once the French Revolution occurred, we understood the whole world as either a democratic world or societies as either democratic or non -demo or not democratic or authoritarian. It is that order that it imposed new categories that now domesticated an empirical world that would otherwise confound the political imaginary. Because if we couldn't, you know, categorize societies as democratic and you know, authoritarian, I don't think political science actually would be able to function today. Or the point I'm making is that what the French Revolution did was to impose a new order or domesticated the empirical political world in a sense that if you think about the political societies that exist in the world, the first thing you think of is it a democratic society or not a democratic society? The Industrial Revolution did the same thing. Is it an industrialized society or not industrialized society? Peter Eke says colonialism does exactly the same thing. It domesticates the environment and brings a certain order that is in consonance with its own logic. And that order, that comes out of colonialism, he says, is understandable through three, what he calls three resultant social formations. He says, if you want to understand all colonial societies, there are three social institutions or social structures or social formations that permeate all colonial societies. All he's suggesting here is that you don't need to go study South Africa, go study Nigeria, go study Niger, or go study India. All of these, if they are colonized societies, there are three, all their social structures 
are categorizable into three social structures. And what are these three social structures that he says result from colonialism? One, he says, they are what he calls the migrated social structures. These are social structures that are imported wholesale from the West or from Europe into colonized societies or into colonial societies. These he calls migrated social structures. To reiterate, these are social structures that are imported wholesale from the West or from Europe and imported into Africa. He gives us a good example of what are imported or migrated social structures, the university. The university is a good example of what he calls the migrated social structure. But Peter Eke is not just interested in the structure as a formal static structure. He says that all structures, all structures are characterized by a forward movement. They reinvent themselves. themselves. So universities renew themselves, discard certain traditions, take on new traditions. But he says the problem with migrated social structures is that often the model that is imported into the colonies is the model that was precisely at the point of being discarded in the mother colony or in Europe. He says, to reiterate, often the model of a migrated social structure that gets imported into the colonies is the one that was often at the moment of being discarded in the mother colony. The result is that, as Peter Eke continues, is that migrated social structures often lack what he calls the necessary ethic for self-renewal and regeneration. Because they are migrated social structures that do not have an internal ethic to renew themselves because when they are imported, he says, they often leave behind that self-propelling ethic or morale to renew themselves. And so they suffer from what he calls fixation. Now in sociology, the concept of fixation means simply this. It's best illustrated using generations. Often people you know, who belong to an older generation tell you, oh, we did it better than you. Uh, your generation doesn't know what was good music. It's fixation. It because it assumes that its own model or time is the best model and time. Therefore, things aren't able to evolve. So I've often heard people of my generation and the generation earlier than mine say, your generation doesn't know music. Because they think of music in terms of their own generation, what was music in time or rather in their own generation. That's the problem of fixation. So social structures, migrated social structures in the continent often suffer from this problem of fixation. So I can give you an example to illustrate the point I'm making. I studied at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. At a time, I studied at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, which is not long ago. Um, I graduated there in, nine, in 2001. At the time I studied there, the University of Ibadan had gowns, graduation gowns that had been used at the moment when the university was invented or rather established in the 1960s. And so the university insisted on using these guns, but there were now fewer. We were many. The result is that the university had to hold graduation over a period of two, three weeks because you had to use a gown and tomorrow someone else had to use it. And so graduations in Ibaran are spread over a long period of time simply because people are holding on to what they think is a venerable tradition. 
These are the gowns that came with the establishment of the university. Damn it, you could simply go out and sew new gowns. It wouldn't mean anything. But because these institutions suffer from fixation, they aren't able to renew themselves. They lack the confidence. That's very important because we would come back to this point. They lack both the ethic and the confidence to depart from the model that was given to them. And so often they have to refer back somewhere when they have to reinvent themselves. One last attempted illustration. <clears throat> A university I'm pretty familiar with because I've visited also to it, Harvard University. When Harvard wants to establish anything, it doesn't, re, it doesn't refer to anyone. When it wants to start a new tradition, it doesn't say, oh, by the way, maybe let's look at what Stanford is doing. It does exactly what it thinks it wants to do. It has the confidence to renew itself and reinvent itself. Most universities in the West have that confidence, but often universities in the colonies first ask, there's a modular, they wouldn't say, but what they are basically saying is that there is a modular example somewhere in the West, let's go look what it is doing. They lack the ethic and the confidence to renew themselves without referring to the modular example that is somewhere in Europe. So Peter Eke says, there are three social structures that result from colonialism. If you want to understand any colony, you must look for these three social structures and all the social structures in the colonies fall into these three categories. Migrated social structures. Two, he says, the second category is that of transformed indigenous social structures, transformed indigenous social structures. So there is nothing indigenous about them. When people tell you about indigenous institutions in Africa, there is nothing such. There's nothing left that can be called an indigenous social structure. These are transformed indigenous social structures. So they existed true but colonialism has transformed them and given them their meaning. So Peter Eke again gives us an example of what he calls transformed indigenous social structures. And there are two interesting examples, but because of time, let us look at what he calls ethnicity. He says, ethnicity did not exist in the continent. Ethnic identities did not exist in the continent. Previously, people belonged into different you know, structures, but what colonialism did was to level up or level down. So you had in certain instances, you know, kingdoms that were pretty huge that were leveled down. And in some other instances, you had smaller groups that were leveled up into an ethnic group for the convenience of colonialism. And so these are transformed indigenous social structures. So when people come and tell us about you know, African identities, ethnic identities, as if they are a true symbolic representative of what we were prior to colonialism, you must tell them it is, it is wrong. These are transformed indigenous social structures that have been given a new logic by you know, colonialism. The last, the last category, according to Peter Eke, is what he calls the emergent social structures. Now, he says there were migrated social structures, transformed indigenous social structures, and then he says there were emergent social structures. Emergent social structures did not exist either in pre-colonial Africa or in the West, but they emerge, they are forced into existence by the logic of colonialism to fill a vacuum that is, or that cannot be filled by either the migrated social structures 
all the transformed indigenous social structures. If you were to think like a sociologist, which he was, he's basically saying, these are structures that performed functions that could neither be performed by the migrated social structures, that could be neither performed by the transformed indigenous social structures. And therefore, these structures had to emerge in order to fill that vacuum. Why did we go into Peter Eke at such length? It was to try and show that the two paradigmatic perspectives we began with last week in thinking about the tragedy or the malaise of development or underdevelopment in the continent, the limit in their explanation is that they do not have an expansive view of colonialism such that they underestimate the effects of colonialism. Because if you now think of colonialism in these terms as AK suggests, in order to undo its effects, you have to take a moment and pause, how do you undo a social movement of epochal dimensions whose effects, supra-individual effects, far outlive the time and space of their occurrence? So basically, you have to have conceptual tools that are adequate to the task. The reason we've gone at length into this alternative understanding of colonialism is partly to show that the two paradigmatic perspectives we began with basically don't have the right conceptual tools with which to upend colonialism because they think of colonialism basically as political and economic domination nothing more. And so for them, we've done away with political domination. All that is left is economic domination, basically. Now, if you think about colonialism in the way in which Eke impels us to, you would see that actually it's far more than just economic domination that remains. This domination extends into the social structure and maybe we have to rethink about these imported social structures, these transformed indigenous social structures, these emergent social structures. What do we do with them in order to be able to get to a point where Africa can develop? This is where we're going to depart today by looking at the failure of the previous conceptual and empirical failure of previous development efforts or models in Africa or projects in Africa. Now, let us underline an important point. Eke is very correct in saying that colonialism is comparable to the Industrial Revolution and to the French Revolution because he says these are the other two epochal movements in the modern period he misses two other important epochal movements that are important for understanding colonialism. The reason I'm saying he misses these two is because you can't think of colonialism without thinking of these other two epochal movements that were occurring precisely at a time when colonialism was happening, but also in a sense enabled colonialism but we're also enabled by colonialism. Let's think of a, in a dialectical way here. Let's not think of, let's not think in a one-way process where you have a cause and an effect. What I'm trying to suggest here is that a cause can both be an effect or rather an event can both be a cause and an effect, which is to say these two other social movements that Eke, Peter Eke misses they have a dialectical relationship with colonialism. They enabled colonialism, but they were also enabled by colonialism. And what are these two other social movements? It is slavery and race and modern race and racism, the invention basically of race, if you wish. 
the coming into existence of race. These were the two other <clears throat> social movements that were critical to the project of colonialism. Because the idea that you could go and colonize our colonize other people's lands was made possible by a certain presumption that these were not yet human. So without race and racism, colonialism would not have been possible. That is why I'm saying that Peter Eke misses these two because they are integral to understanding colonialism. If you manage to find yourself in the course I advertised at the beginning, we'll deal at length with the invention of race and the invention of being black the identity black, you know. Um, what at this moment is important to understand is that the idea of colonialism and the practice of colonialism is made possible by this other social movement called, you know, the invention of race or modern race and racism, which basically says to Europeans, they are an epitome of humanity and the rest of the world is not, and therefore it is right to colonize and enslave that other part of the world. Slavery was equally made possible by race and racism, because if you would recall, Hegel, the philosopher, says that slavery was necessary in order to teach us, non-Western people or particularly Black people, to teach us how to be human. So the justification of slavery by Hegel and other enlightenment philosophers, not only Hegel, the justification of slavery was that it was necessary for us, in fact, in Hegel's words, let me paraphrase, no, quote him directly. In Hegel's words, slavery was necessary because it represents a moment of transition for Africans from their state of animality to being human. So, as you can see, slavery and racism are two other important social movements that Peter Ake misses. And we will see later on why these two movements are necessary, particularly in the last lecture when we try to proffer solutions as to how do we get out of this impasse of development which I have suggested is the impasse of modernity rather than the impasse of development. What we have to get out of is this thing called modernity. In order for Africa to develop, to give you an answer, and to summarize in a sentence the last lecture, in order for the continent to develop, what it has to jettison is modernity. As long as the aspiration is to be modern, it will never develop. But you know, um, that is for the last lecture. The point I'm trying to make is that Peter Eke misses that important social movement, those two important social movements, because they are integral to understanding today why the continent is underdeveloped. And as we said, the reason we went into Peter Eke at length is because through Peter Eke, we can see why from ab initio, the two paradigmatic perspectives we began with were bound to fall short because they had a very narrow or limited understanding of what colonialism is. Enough has been said about that. Let us now examine what have been the conceptual and practical or empirical failures of previous developments in previous development models or projects in Africa. For heuristic reasons, I'm going to suggest to you that development in Africa has had two distinct careers. For heuristic reasons, I'm going to suggest to you that development in Africa has had two distinct careers. One career stretching from the immediate post-colonial period, which is the 1960s, stretching from 1960s up until 1980. Again, these are heuristic uh, 
you know, uh, time, time periods. As I've said, I'm going to suggest to you that colonialism has, I mean, rather the concept and the practice of development, and let me be specific, the concept and practice of development in Africa has had two careers. One career stretching from 1960 up until 1980. The second stretching from 1980 up until 2000. I will say a little about what has happened about development in Africa from 2000 up until the present. I will say a little at the end as to what I think has happened, but I do not think that that period 2000 up until the present represents a distinct career of development of the concept and practice of development. I will explain why I think that something else has been happening from 2000 up until the present in the continent. That era from 2000 up until the present, for, uh, for it to make sense, I call it the era of hypermodernity or the era of hyperglobalization. So at the end, I'm going to say a little about that, about that, you know, stretch in the career of development in Africa. So that we're clear, for heuristic reasons, I'm suggesting that development, the career of the concept and practice of development in Africa has had two distinct or identifiable, you know, moments. The first moment from 1960 up until 1980, the second moment from 1980 up until 1990, and the last from 2000, 1960 to 1980, 1980 to 2000, and then 2000 uh, to the present. Um, I would say a little about that last moment, which I do not think, as I've said, represents a distinct career in the life of development both as a concept and as praxis in Africa. So in a sense, what I'm going to do from now on is to look at the career of the concept and practice of development in Africa from 1960 up until 1980, and from 1980 up until 2000. And then I would say a little about 19, 2000 to the present. So let us then return to that era immediately after independence, which is 1960 to 1980. And by the way, I still await anyone who wants to suggest that there is something autochthonous about, you know, or there's any institution or structure in Africa today that exists precisely as it had existed in pre-colonial Africa. So let us return to that first moment, which is the moment immediately after independence, which is 1960 to 1980. To start with, I want to suggest to you that curiously in Africa, at this time, there is a very curious ideological convergence between the left-leaning and the liberal regimes on the meaning, which is the theory and the practice of development in Africa. In a sense, if you wish, there was some kind of consensus in Africa from 1960 up until 1980 about the meaning of the concept and its practice. And this consensus brought together people who were left-leaning and people with liberal inclinations. And so there, you couldn't tell whether a regime was liberal or Marxist or whether a regime was conservative or radical because there was convergence about the meaning of the concept development and its practice. Again, so that uh, the point is very clear. Nigeria has had a very conservative political posture ideologically from independence up until it has never had a radical Marxist outlook in its government. 
But if you look at Nigeria's development paradigm from 1960 up until 1980, it is exactly that of Tanzania, for instance, which had a Marxist regime under Mwali Munyere. We are going to see how in a moment. But what I'm trying to suggest to you is that in the continent, in this era, 1960 up until 1980, whether people were Marxist or radical or conservative or liberal, they united on what was the meaning of development, both at the level of theory and at the level of practice, both at the le level of meaning or at the conceptual level and at an empirical level. This convergence on those two levels found expression concretely in what was called a developmental state. This convergence found expression concretely in what was known as the developmental state, or more precisely in what was thought of as state-led development. So in Africa, there was no question about the role of the state in development in the 1960s up until 1980, because there was a supposition that the model of development, which was state-led development model, was an agreed upon development model. In this model, basically, the state was handed the responsibility of being a catalyst for development. In this era, the state was basically handed the responsibility of being a catalyst for development. As such, the state participated in every sector of the economy. So the state became, for instance, the largest employer of labor. The state too controlled or regulated the prices of commodities. And this it did through various boards. At other times they were called the marketing boards. At other times they were called the commodity boards. They exist today in another form, you know, as parastatals. But the point is that the state, in the state-led development model, the state was handed the responsibility of being a catalyst for development. The result is that the state basically participated in every sector of the economy. And the result is that the state became the largest employer of labor. The state controlled and regulated the prices of commodities and that it did through marketing boards and other commodity boards. Now, all of this, these few characteristics, these are things that you would often associate with leftist states or leftist regimes. But if you went to Nigeria in the 1960s, all of these were present. The state controlled prices of commodities. <clears throat> the state you know, regulated um, the circulation of commodities through marketing boards, and the state was the largest employer of labor. And the state participated in every sector of the economy. If you went to Tanzania, it was the same thing. So you couldn't tell that this was a conservative regime, this was a radical regime, because they converged on the theory and practice of development. But let us continue to unravel the characteristics of this state-led development model. We've identified a few of its characteristics. But in line with the expectations and the promises of independence, the state also expanded phenomenally the provision of social services. It did not only participate in every sector of the economy, the state also expanded in line with the expectations of independence and the promises of independence. It expanded phenomenally the provision of 
social services. In fact, to be precise, it expanded the provision of free social services. Free healthcare. There was free healthcare. There was free education. All of these things became a norm throughout the continent. It was not only Tanzania that provided free education because it was Marxist leaning. Nigeria also provided free education, conservative as it was. Because there was a convergence at the time in the continent about what was known as the state-led development model where the state was handed the responsibility to be a catalyst for development. If you study and live in these parts, of course, you come to think of the private sector as, or the market as basically having that responsibility of being a catalyst for development. At this time, as we have just demonstrated, it was the state that was handed that responsibility, not because people were left leaning. This was across the ideological divide. So there was free social health, free social services, or free education, free health. And these things were a norm. They were assumed to be a given. You didn't have to argue about them. You didn't have to go to the streets to demonstrate about them or to protest demanding free education as we have been doing in South Africa today. In the 1960s, in the continent, these things were assumed to be a given. Think of your countries for those who come from the continent. What was life like in the 60s and in the 70s? Everyone would, of course, remember that era as the era of free social services, of a state that provided free education and free healthcare. The result is that literacy rate or literacy rate dramatically improved throughout the continent. In fact, some countries in the continent today still claim actually the progress made during that time. Literacy rate dramatically improved throughout the continent. There were countries that could claim up to 90% literacy rate. Tanzania was one of them. If you go to the continent today, there are very few countries that can claim anything above 60, 70% of literacy, which is a vast contrast to what happened in the continent in the 1960s. But it was not only literacy rates that improved, the incidence of disease was very low because social health care was free. Life expectancy was much better in the continent then than it is now because social health, I mean, rather health care was provided for free. For those of you who study demography or other related disciplines, I challenge you to go and look at the demographic you know, um, line of the continent in the 1960s up until 1970 and compare it to now. Or in simpler terms, look at life expectancy in the continent in the 1960s and compare it to now. But let us not get sidetracked. Here's the point. It is that <clears throat> in this first career of the concept of development, there was a convergence of thought, so to say, about the meaning of development. And this would result in what was known as state-led development model. And as we've just tried to demonstrate, the state was handed the responsibility to be a catalyst for development. And as such, the state participated in all the sectors of society, so to say, not only in the economy, but in the provision of free social services. But here is the point. It is that, of course, all of this had to be paid for. All of this had to be paid for. The free healthcare, the free education had to be paid for 
it had to be paid for, paid for not only in monetary terms, it also had to be paid for in terms of skilled manpower. This is very important. All of these things had to be paid for, but they had to be paid for not only in monetary terms, they also had to be paid for in terms of skilled manpower that would be able to provide free quality healthcare, that would be able to provide free quality education. And by the way, when I say education was free, it was not only free at a primary level or pre-university level. In most countries, it was free up to university level. And curiously in Nigeria, it was not only education that was free, even the meals were provided for free in the universities. And so all you had to do was to present yourself to the university, everything else was provided for you. But all of these things had to be paid for. But we'll come to see in a moment what is the implication of these things having to be paid for, not only in monetary terms, but also in terms of skilled manpower. As we've said, the state became not just a catalyst for development, but in real terms, the state became the largest employer of labor. In the language of liberal economics, the state became bloated. In the language of liberal economics today or mainstream economics, the state became bloated because it needed in fact, not that it needed the model itself, it was inherent in the model that the state would be the largest employer of labor because it participated in every sector of the economy, provided free education and free healthcare and expanded this and tried to make it truly universal, which is to say that access, access was universal. Anyone could access free healthcare and anyone could access free education. When we say access is universal, for those who study health would know it is that it is accessible in terms of need and geography. You get it within a certain radius and you get it you know, in terms of need, whatever need you have, health need you have at that particular moment. So it's not that the clinic is there, you go there, but they say, oh, we can't provide you with this service. No, on the basis of need. But let us not get sidetracked. <clears throat> the post-colonial state became bloated. The post-colonial African state all over Africa found itself in an untenable situation where the earnings or where it's revenue could no longer pay for the costs of running this developmental or bloated state. Within a short space of time, the state found itself in an untenable situation where revenue did not match expenditure. More concretely, the, state, the state's revenue could no longer pay for this developmental model. Faced with such a situation or faced with these shortfalls, these budgetary shortfalls or budgetary deficits, the state at first throughout the continent resorted to printing more money. Most African states as a response to this deficit, to this budgetary shortfall, most African states basically resorted to <clears throat> printing more money. Of course, for those who study economics know what that leads to. Leads to rampant inflation. So inflation basically was, on, was uncontrollable. If you're looking for an example for this, you have to look at Zimbabwe today. Those of you who are familiar with that country would know that it has thought, you know, that 
because it's the economy has collapsed, what do you do? You print more money. The result is that you have, you know, a currency where you need how many millions to buy one dollar? Uh, we've lost count basically as to how many millions of the Zim dollar you need in order to buy just, you know, one. Those are the results, partly, of course. It's not the full picture. Uh, it's not the full explanation. But when you print more money, because you don't have the earnings necessary to finance the economy, the result is <clears throat> rampant inflation that is difficult to bring under control. So that is why you see the elite, the political elite in Zimbabwe today, they ban, or rather they say the dollar, the US dollar is the currency. It's because you have a situation of uncontrollable, you know, inflation. But that's not our concern. The concern is to say that most African states faced with this dilemma where there were budgetary deficits, where their earnings or their revenue could no longer pay for this development model. Most states basically resorted to printing money. The result was hyperinflation. But things came to a head, so to say. Things came to a head in 1973. The year 1973 basically proved to be the most definitive in the life of development's you know, first career in Africa. What happened in 1973? Now, for those of you who have a sense of history, it is basically the year of the Arab-Israeli war. So what do you see in Gaza today has a long history. It's not happening for the first time. You know, it has a long history, but one of the iterations of it was in 1973. Arab states are fighting with Israel over Palestine. Most Arab states are oil producing. And because America is supporting Israel just as it's doing today, Arab states decide to place an embargo on the sale of oil to America. And so the oil producing states, the Arabic or the you know, Arab oil producing states decided in simpler terms you know, to sanction the sale of oil to America. And so they reduced the production of oil and gave themselves quotas with reduced barrels of oil produced and exported. What happened as a result is that the price of oil more than quadrupled. It was good for the oil producing states, but it was bad for the rest of the continent, other than the few oil producing states in the continent, because with the phenomenal increase, prices of oil did not double, they quadrupled. With the increase in the prices of oil, this meant that African states that are not oil producing, and there are only about what oil producing states in Africa, there are about three or four. Angola, Nigeria, Mozambique, I think Algeria. Other than those states, the rest of the continent was faced with a problem because the prices of oil, the price of oil shot up, which meant that fuel became expensive. And of course, because all of them import oil and fuel, it meant that you already have a budgetary deficit. Then 1973 happens, it means that your deficit is going to widen even further because the cost of oil, which is integral to any economy for the production process, has become also unmanageable. And so 1973 basically brought most of these states to their knees. Of course, again, for those who study you know, economics would know that and history, would know that for Nigeria, this was precisely the era that in Nigeria, the Nigerian then military head of state said, the problem for Nigeria is not money, it is how to spend it. The reason was because for them, the prices of oil had quadrupled and so there was income 
that had not been budgeted for even focus because the prices of oil did not double, but you know they increased by four, you know, uh, exponential. So there was an excess of money, excess liquidity in the Nigerian economy. As a result, they would say in 1970, in the 1970s, they would say, you know, the problem for Nigeria is not money, it is how to spend it. By the 1990s, the story had changed. They said that the case of Nigeria mm -hmm. is the case of oil. They rather would not have had oil because the reason they were underdeveloped was because of oil. But, you know, um, that's, that's, you know, by the way, the point we're making is that 1973, basically, if by 1973, African states were still trying to figure out how to restore onto you know, a proper cause, their state-led development model, 1973 shattered that possibility. It basically said this model is not going to survive. So in large part, because of the 1973 oil crisis, when the prices of oil shot up, most of Africa's developmental states were left unable to fund their commitments completely. It was a combination of two things. They couldn't fund you know, their commitments completely. Inflation was on the rise the increase in the prices of oil meant stagnation. Two things came together and gave us a concept in economics today called stagflation, the coming together of economic stagnation and inflation. That's where that concept, if you've heard it, comes from, stagflation. The coming together of stagnation, economic stagnation and inflation. So that was the reality of African, of this development model, the state-led development model in Africa, in a, or rather of the state-led development model in Africa. 1973 was a very bad year for that, for that you know, model. The coming together of high inflation and economic stagnation basically sounded the death knell for that development model. So this basically set the stage for the commencement of the second of the second career moment in the life of development as a concept and as practice in Africa. But we haven't got into that second stage, which begins in 1980, we're in 1973. So 1973 basically opened the door for the second you know, stage or you know, time period in the career of development as a concept and as practice in Africa. The second moment in this career of development in Africa, as I've said, began in 1980. But its door was opened by 1973 because when faced with the worsening balance of payment, now balance of payment basically is a simple term in economics. Uh, the last time there was no one studying economics. Is there anyone today here who studies economics? I think there is someone who's denying his or her discipline at the back, but it's fine. <laughs> um, basically, balance of payment is, you know, economics creates, mainstream economics creates a lot of myths, you know, and it basically functions on the basis of them. One of the myths is that in order for the economy to be healthy, there must be a balance between the cost of your imports and what you import. And so once you import more than what your exports earn you, 
you then suffer what is called a balance of payment deficit. Once you import more, the cost of your imports, it's not more in quantity. It's more in terms of price. Once you pay more for your imports than what your exports earn you, you suffer what is called the balance of payments deficit. So by 1973 onwards, African states were faced with worsening balance of payment statements. They were faced with budget deficits, but they were also faced with budgets that just could not cover the costs of free healthcare, the cost of free education. Basically, they could not pay the salaries of this bloated state. They could not pay salaries. And so these countries, as a result of all of these things, balance of payment deficits, budget deficits, inability to pay salaries, and all of these things, they had no option but to turn to the international financial institutions or the lending institutions, particularly the IMF and the World Bank. Because they couldn't meet their own needs, they now had to turn to these lending international financial institutions. It was these institutions, particularly the IMF and the World Bank in the main, which inaugurated the second phase in the career of development in Africa. Which is to say, and this is very important, you must underline the fact that I'm saying it was the IMF and the World Bank or the international financial institutions that inaugurated the second phase in the career of development in Africa. Why I'm putting it that way, it is because at both the conceptual, philosophical, and ideological level, and at a practical or empirical level, development assumed a new meaning given to it by the international financial institutions. The continent completely lost any role in this moment of the second career of development, both at a conceptual level and at the level of practice. We can see that in the first moment, at least at the level of practice, because at the level of thought or at a conceptual level, they also did not touch the meaning of development, even in 1960 up until 1980. But at least the continent had autonomy over the meaning of development at the level of praxis. From 1980 onwards, the World Bank and the IMF or the international financial institutions generally assumed responsibility for giving meaning at a conceptual, ideological, philosophical, and at a practical and empirical level. They assumed sole responsibility for giving meaning to development in Africa. So in a sense, Africa completely lost autonomy over even thinking about development, not just the practice of it. It completely lost autonomy over thinking about the meaning of development. <clears throat> and again, to reiterate, to reiterate, that is to say that at both the conceptual and empirical level, development assumed a new meaning given to it by the World Bank and the IMF. Because most African states tend to the IMF and the World Bank in order to be able to salvage the situation, and the World Bank had assumed responsibility for giving meaning to development, the answer or the new development model that came out of that was the neoliberal capitalist development model. But I want to qualify that by saying that it was not just the neoliberal development or neoliberal capitalist development model. It was rampant neoliberalism. 
It was neoliberalism in the language of young people. I hear them sometimes say, you know, it was neoliberalism on steroids. It was basically neoliberalism or neoliberal capitalism that knew no bounds. That was the answer or the new meaning that development assumed as African states turned to IMF, the World Bank, and the international financial institutions generally in order to salvage themselves from the moment of collapse they had reached as a result of the development model they adopted, but also as a result of what came out of 1973. So at this moment, we see a transition to the second career of development in Africa. And if the first moment is the moment of a state-led development model, the second moment is a moment of rampant neoliberal capitalist development. Of course, this development model, this rampant neoliberal capitalist development model had a name that was less ideological and so made people less suspecting. The name that it preferred to go by was structural adjustment. Many of these African states that had turned to the World Bank and to the IMF because they couldn't pay the salaries of their civil servants, they suffered budget deficits, they had you know, balance of payment deficits, the solution given to them was structural adjustment programs. The World Bank did not say you must go neoliberal, no. It did not claim that you must become a neoliberal capitalist economy, no, no. It said to them, the problem with your economies are structural. And so in order to remedy the problem, you must structurally reform your economies. Now, again, those who study economics would know that structural aspects of the economy belong to a field of economics, which is macroeconomics, not microeconomics, but macroeconomics, which is basically everything, because I don't know what is left, you know, if you take macroeconomics. But it's another myth in economics that there is a distinction between macro and microeconomics. The point is that basically the development model that the World Bank and the IMF imposed on African states was a neoliberal capitalist development model, but did not assume mm -hmm. that name. It had a less innocuous name, which was structural adjustment. Basically, this is how the model became the order of the day. As each African state or African country approached the IMF and the World Bank for a bailout, the World Bank and the IMF imposed conditions on the loans that they gave to these countries. And these conditions basically of the loan, just like when you go to ask for a loan in a bank today, there are conditions. Basically, the World Bank attached low, I mean, conditions to these loans as these African states were turning to them for a bailout. The summary of these conditions was that you must structurally adjust. Hence the name Structural Adjustment Program. In concrete, in concrete terms or in empirical terms, structural adjustment entailed fulfilling the following economic conditions. One, states, African states had to withdraw subsidies. All the subsidies that they had given to education, to health, they had to withdraw those subsidies. And to some commodities, to the production of some commodities or agricultural sectors, every kind of a subsidy had to be withdrawn. This is how you ended up with countries like Nigeria that produce oil 
but can't afford the price of petrol because partly the subsidies had to be withdrawn. So concretely or empirically, structurally adjusting meant fulfilling the following economic conditions. One, conditionalities rather. One, you had to withdraw the subsidies. Two, you had to engage in what was called trade and market liberalization. Three, you had to devalue the currency, currency devaluation. Four, there was something very bizarre that African states had to do. Education, health, and other social services were free. But as a result of structural adjustment, they began introducing what was called user charges, which meant that now you had to pay for education, now you had to pay for health. But they did not call them school fees or tuition fees or fees, healthcare charges, they call them user charges. You know why they call them user charges? Basically, there was an attempt to say, it is those who use them who have to pay, not everyone. As if you had an option not to use the services. But in a, in a moment, we'll see that actually that's what it led to. It led to fewer people using the services. Fewer people went to school, fewer people went to clinics and hospitals because of these user charges. Withdrawal of subsidies, trade and market liberalization, currency devaluation, introduction of user charges. Five, deregulation of the market, which meant that all those marketing boards and those commodity boards had to go. Six, rationalization of the state, which basically meant retrenchment. You had to reduce the number of people employed in the state, but they called it rationalization of the state. These were the six main, there were others in certain instances, but these were uniform across the continent. Every country that turned to the IMF and the World Bank looking for a loan, there was a standard text. These are your conditionalities for you to, for us to give you the bailout. I'm going to say something about the introduction of user charges because it's very important. What happened as a result of the introduction of user charges, that benefit that the continent had bestowed unto itself with free education and free healthcare, which is increased literacy, which also has an impact, a positive impact on healthy lifestyle, which improves your life expectancy, that benefit that the continent had given to itself basically disappeared. Because as a result of user charges, we know from empirical studies of structural adjustment effects on healthcare, fewer women, for instance, decided to remain in their neonatal and postnatal programs. You know what those are? So they basically withdrew from their neonatal and postnatal programs, which is basically what women have to attend um, when they are pregnant, starting from the third quarter of pregnancy up until after pregnancy, they have to go to the clinic, you know, once a month. Now, with the user charges, basically many people in the continent could not afford because every time they went to the clinic, they would have to pay. But as we know, with pregnant people or pregnant women, they do not only go once a month. Often sickness strikes at any given moment such that the visits to the clinic become regular. The result is that many women withdrew from mainstream neonatal and postnatal programs. The offshoot of that was that traditional options became much more favored. So studies basically looking at the numbers in many African countries show that many women withdrew from neonatal and postnatal programs. The result of that, of course, is that 
life expectancy from zero to five fell dramatically. Basically, the number of children who die before the age of five shot up. Because if you were not attending the neonatal program, there was no way of telling whether the child you know, has any deficiency. And therefore, many kids were born either you know, with many deficiencies. And therefore, the number of people, or rather of children dying before the age of five increased dramatically. The larger implication was that as a result of this life expectancy in the continent decreased seriously. On the other hand, we said earlier that literacy rates in the continent in the 1960s up until the 70s were very high. Some countries like Tanzania claiming up to 90%. In fact, Tanzania had the highest literacy rate in the continent. I'm not sure what is the literacy rate in Tanzania today, but surely it has fallen dramatically from the celebrated 90 something that it had in the 1960s. But this was the story throughout the continent. But also with the introduction of use of charges, it meant that fewer people could go to the university. Now this is where you must look closely to generational differences that often are expressed by people who lived in the 60s and the 70s who mainly went to school, many of them studying up to PhD, and the current generation that often is unable to go that far. Because the people in the 1960s and 70s had free education. It was free in all respects. You were fed, housed for free. And so it was easy to study right up to PhD. That is why today in the continent, people are telling us all sorts of nonsense. What about we need schemes in order to encourage people to go to school and study up to PhD when we know basically how the structure has made it impossible. You then go look for explanations in people, not in the structure. You basically say, how do we motivate people? But nonetheless, the point is that the continent lost all the benefits it had given unto itself with free healthcare and free education. So those were the economic conditionalities. There were political conditionalities also, which basically often entailed the liberalization of the political space, or which simply meant that Previously authoritarian or one party regimes basically had to hold elections. This was one of the conditions that was imposed as, or one of the political conditionalities that was imposed on African states. Now, early 80s, the political conditionalities were not there. They were added in the mid 80s from 1985 onwards. This explains why in the continent from the 1980s onwards, there is what is called a democratic ferment or democratic transitions. Many of these democratic transitions were very superficial. Ask anyone in Kenya, Mze Arab, Mze Moi, organized elections just to meet the conditionalities. The elections were a facade. They were nothing but a facade in order to meet the conditionalities that had been imposed on him. In fact, Mze Moy was in a difficult situation because he had gone to borrow money to finance 90% of the budget in that year. And he had no option but to abide by those political conditionalities. It was actually Japan that bailed you know, Kenya out that year. And in several other countries, you had similar stories. Basically, you had authoritarian regimes that quickly learned how to organize what appeared like democratic elections that met the expectations of the external funders, but not the expectations of the people. Because at that point, the continent, the people in the continent had completely lost autonomy over their political and economic you know, um, variables in their countries. But the point we are making is that 
there were political conditionalities also. And often these political conditionalities entailed countries pluralizing or liberalizing their political space, which was basically one party regimes or military regimes organizing elections. And you know, the interesting part is that once that happened, you found many people who were military heads of state winning elections and becoming democratic heads of state. In many African countries, you had people today who were military heads of states who had been military heads of states for 30 and above. And then overnight, they transformed themselves into democratic governments. It was common throughout the continent as a result of the political conditionalities. But of course, by the end of the 1990s, everyone knew that structural adjustment was a flop, or in simpler terms, structural adjustment had failed. The withdrawal of subsidies had led to food shortages in many countries, or food prices skyrocketed. In fact, in 1990, the year 1990 in the continent was the year of food riots. If you go look at the continent from Zambia, it was maize riots. Algeria, it was bread riots. In several countries, there were food riots throughout the continent as a result of structural adjustments, withdrawal of subsidies, which meant that the prices of food skyrocketed, but also which meant that food became scarce, not just that the prices skyrocketed, food became scarce. We've said that the introduction of user charges and the withdrawal of subsidies meant the withdrawal of mothers from neonatal and postnatal programs. But structural adjustment programs were also criticized for their undemocratic nature because they were often negotiated in secret. You basically had Young people, in often, often cases it was young people, you basically had an African country that was in trouble and needed a bailout. It assembled young people, often like you, educated in Western universities, dressed them well in nice suits, sent them off to Washington to go and apply for a loan, and negotiated the fate of their countries in secrecy and came back with structural adjustment packages that had to be imposed on the rest of the country without the people having any input in those structural adjustment programs. In fact, in many societies, the masses of the people said, we don't want structural adjustment. And often regimes would come and say, if you don't want structural adjustment, what should we do? The people said, we are ready to pay the sacrifice rather than take the loan. In Nigeria, there was a referendum about structural, whether to take structural adjustment or not. Babangita, who was the military head of state at the time, basically realized that the people didn't want structural adjustment, but still continued. There were many other countries where there were referendums over structural adjustment or even if there was not a referendum where public opinion was expressly against structural adjustment program. In certain instances, people said, we are ready to take salary cuts in order to be able to see through this difficult period because they had seen in other countries what structural adjustment programs do. But be that as it may, these young Western educated, you know, people who were sent off you know, in business class tickets by their countries to go and negotiate in Washington, came back with these structural adjustment programs already fully negotiated for their presidents to sign. And so there was no democratic element. These structural adjustment programs themselves were shrouded in secrecy and they eroded the democratic element or democratic ethos of their societies. But they also did something else. 
what structural adjustment programs did was basically to transform development into an exclusive preserve of people with technical know-how. It basically transformed development into a technical endeavor. So it was basically now an exclusive preserve of technocrats, people who could understand the language of economics and people who could speak the language of the international financial institutions. And you see it today, still present, we think that development is something that we who are educated have to go and tell people what it means to be developed and what it would take for them to be developed. And so we've come to assume that you require a certain technical know-how or a certain level of Western education to understand what it means to be developed. Imagine a young 25 year old graduate of Northwestern going to tell a grandmother of 75, 80, 90, what it means to be developed. What license gives you as a Western educated person to tell someone who's been happy for 70 years or 80 years what it means to be developed? Because we've come to assume that development is a, techno, is a technical endeavor that can only be led and managed by people who have technical know-how. But let us continue so that we can get to the end. Put differently, what structural adjustment did is that it led to the depoliticization of development. Development ceased to be a political issue. It now became a technical issue. You basically have to balance you know, your books. You have to get you know, um, the variables right. And then you would be developed. So rather than help the situation, actually, Structural adjustment led to more misery. This is why scholars in criticizing structural adjustment became calling for what they called structural adjustment with a human face. Because the tendency in structural adjustment was basically to look at the macroeconomic variables and often you quantified them and removed the human beings as long as the numbers made sense, whether people were dying or not, it did not matter. As long as you could restore your balance of payments, as long as you could get the other you know, macroeconomic variables right in numbers, irrespective of what was happening to people, it didn't matter. And so one of the things that happened as a result of structural adjustment is that it was the country's as the countries became poorer, <coughs> sorry, <clears throat> as the countries became, <coughs> my, <clears throat> I need water, but uh, <clears throat> let's see <clears throat> if I would survive. So <clears throat> what happened is that as countries became poorer, something odd happened. It is that they became celebrated as the successful case studies of structural adjustment. Guess who were the star pupils of the World Bank and the IMF? It was Ghana and Uganda. Those were the countries at the time in the 1990s that the World Bank celebrated as the most successful. I mean, those are amongst the most poor countries in the continent. I mean, Ghana has improved in the recent past, you know, um, as a result of gold, but it is again improvement that is superficial, just at the level of earnings that does not translate into, you know, a quality of life. I mean, Ghana is now called a middle income country, I think. Um, but the point is that <clears throat> there was something odd happening. It is that as the people became poorer, the World Bank celebrated and said that 
these were the success cases. In fact, Zimbabwe at a point became a success case, you know, of structural adjustment. So <clears throat> in criticizing structural adjustment, African scholars began calling what, for what they called structural adjustment with a human face. The reason they called for structural adjustment with a human face was because the obsession was getting the books right, irrespective of the consequences at the level of the lived human experience. The lending institution, institutions and the West generally responded to sub failure with what was called poverty alleviation programs. When structural adjustment obviously failed because if you had a country, I mean, you had a continent, um, you know, with so many countries and there were very few African countries that did not structurally adjust, very few. Um, so let's say for argument's sake, you know, 48 of the 52, 53 African countries structurally adjusted. Of course, South Sudan did not exist at the time. Um, <clears throat> if you say 48 of the African countries structurally adjusted and you could only point to two dubious success cases, because these were dubious success cases. The books were right, the people were poor. It meant that structural adjustment indeed was a failure. But rather than admit that structural adjustment had been a wasted decade by 1990 in the continent, because even if the first model failed, at least I suspect it can still take some positives out. I mean, life expectancy, education, I mean, literacy rates, and all of those things had improved. In the second model, we see nothing improving, except the books, the books improve. So <clears throat> by 1990, the IMF and the World Bank also realized that structural adjustment had been a failure. But rather than admit that structural adjustment had been a failure, what it did was to produce supplementary papers which were called poverty alleviation strategies or poverty alleviation papers or poverty alleviation programs. These were appended to structural adjustment. Now I did not, I don't have to tell you, you know, how useless those poverty alleviation strategies or poverty alleviation papers, you know, were. The point we are concerned with is that this was the second moment in the long torturous career of development in the continent. The second moment by the 1990s is already reaching a difficult moment. Of course, this continued up until 2000 when it was completely abandoned. Structural adjustment together with <clears throat> you know, um, together with the poverty alleviation strategies ceased to be, you know, the model of development in the continent. Now I would return in my closing remarks about 2000 till the present as to what I think has happened to development then. What I want to do at this moment basically is to surface the limitations because our concern is with the failures, both at a conceptual and at a practical level of these development models. What I want to do now is to surface the limitations of these development models, less at a practical level, but more at a conceptual level. Because I think that the challenge of development in the continent cannot be surpassed or transcended at a practical level. You can take, to illustrate what I mean, <clears throat> okay, let me use a bad example that will easily drive the point home. You, we all are in America today. We know that this country has a serious problem of structural poverty that afflicts black Americans. 
This country has enough money. It gives aid to other countries. It actually donates money to other countries. It has a budget to aid Israel, to aid you know, Ukraine. That budget surely can solve the problem of poor Black Americans over time. If you decided that all the aid we give to other countries, we cut it by half and resolve the problem of you know, poverty amongst Black Americans, which is a structural poverty, America can do that. It has the money. So at the level of praxis, what we are going to say is that if America rationalized its budget, it can resolve the problem of poverty amongst Black Americans. You would have missed the point. The problem does not exist at the level of praxis or at that practical level. The problem exists at a conceptual level. What you first have to attend to are certain philosophical and ideological and conceptual assumptions that make it acceptable in America to go spend money elsewhere and leave Black Americans here poor. The money is not the problem. So the problem is not the praxis. The problem are the philosophical, ideological, and conceptual underpinnings that make it acceptable and rationalizable, or that remove a moral blight on America when you have so much money and you have only 12% of the population. Black Americans are only about 12 to 14% of the population, which means that if you did simple, simple, you know, economic modeling and calculated how much this country spends on average per capita on a white American and calculated how much would be needed in order to up what it spends on black Americans to that level. And then look at the amount of money it sends outside and see how much you need to claw back from that in order to up the per capita expenditure on black Americans. You can easily do that model and you would get it. So the problem I'm trying to suggest with all of this is that the problem is not a lack of ability to do that modeling. No, the problem resides elsewhere at a philosophical, at a conceptual and at an ideological level. Why is it that no one is thinking of doing it? Or why is it that it has become acceptable in America that it shouldn't be done? That's the philosophical and the conceptual level. Now, why am I giving you that stark example? It is to suggest to you that to criticize the failure of development models in Africa at a practical level is not going to help. The problem does not exist at the level of praxis. The problem exists at a conceptual level, at a philosophical level. Only then, would you then be able to resolve the problem at a practical state once you have resolved it at a theoretical level? So my critique of these two development, of these two careers of development in Africa are less going to be at a, at a practical level. And so I meet often people who tell me, oh, there's too much corruption in the continent. I mean, absolute nonsense. Um, if you look at the money, I come from South Africa. If you <clears throat> quantify the amount of money the Western private sector steals out of South Africa and compare it to what you, the political elite steals, the ratio is one to 70. Let me illustrate. We have healthcare insurance in South Africa, just like you do in America. We did what is called a health market survey or a health market inquiry. It was done by the Competition Com Commission. What it did was basically to ask all the health insurance providers, tell us in the past five years, you've increased your insurance you know, rates by this amount. Break it down, what occasions this increase? So they were increasing their, you know, what do we call, I don't know what they are called here, but we call them monthly, you know, um, rates in South Africa, where you pay to your health insurer. They had been increasing them by 
10 to 15 percent every year. And so the competition commission said, break it down for us. After three attempts, three attempts to break it down, they couldn't account for 38 percent of the increase. So that's money stolen. But you see, because the problem is that when you think about corruption, you think about money that someone too can put in their pocket, you say that's corruption. What corporate steals in the continent is nothing comparable to what the political elite steals. So when someone tells you, oh, there's too much corruption, ask them what is the ratio. But my point is a different one. It is that the practical state of the failure of development. Yes, it is important, but it is not going to help us. Just as I've tried to demonstrate with the American example of Black Americans, there's money, but why is it not happening? It's the same thing. We have to look, we had to surface the problem to a theoretical or elevate the problem to its theoretical or philosophical existence in order to be able to resolve it at an empirical level. So, as I've said, <clears throat> what I'm now going to do is to try and surface the conceptual or the philosophical flaws of the two development models that we have looked at. And then, as I've said, I will conclude by looking at or saying a few words about the character of development in Africa in the era of hypermodernity, which is the era post 2000 to the present. So to start with, if you look at, if you go back to the two development models that we looked at, there is none that engages with the meaning of development at a conceptual level. Even in the 1960s and 1970s, if you scan through the literature, there is no effort to define what development means at a conceptual level. There is a certain supposition that the meaning of development is a given. It's education, it's healthcare, it's more roads, you know, it's more amenities, and that's the supposition. So, my point is that throughout these two eras, so to say, or time periods, the meaning of development was never interrogated at a conceptual and at a philosophical level. What was taken as a given, or the meaning was taken as a given, it was assumed. But what was actually assumed was its practice, not its philosophical underpinnings. No one bothered to ask the philosophical underpinnings of these development models. The result is that development in Africa was assumed to mean westernization. Basically, development was assumed to mean becoming like the West. Let us replicate what the developed societies, which is another name for Western societies, let us become like Western societies. Assuming that being Western equates being developed. So the failure to interrogate the meaning of development basically left the continent in a trap, basically in a trap of path dependency which is basically to say that to become developed is to become like the West. And so development meant Westernization. Of course, you see this practical and empirical understanding of development that we've left aside was a practical consequence was a logical consequence. It followed logically from the philosophical and the conceptual rumination of development called modernization theory, or westernization, basically. Let's simplify. All I'm saying 
is that because the continent failed to interrogate at a conceptual level the meaning of development, we ended up with development existing at a practical state. But this practical state was a logical consequence of a philosophical thinking about development in the West. And so we were trapped basically trying to give effect at a practical level to a model that had philosophical underpinnings in the West. But we never engaged with those philosophical underpinnings. Now, what were those philosophical underpinnings? They were outlined clearly in what was called the modernization theory. Now, the major assumptions of the modernization theory are the following. Modernization theory assumes that all societies move in a unilinear direction or in a unilinear path to development. And they begin from the same originary moment, which is the traditional state and move towards a development or a developed or a modern state. Let us re reiterate that point. The first assumption of the modernization theory is that all societies the world over move in a unilinear direction. They begin from being pre-modern or underdeveloped and they moved toward they move towards being developed. Depending on who you speak to, if you're speaking to a Marxist, Marxist would say all societies move from being pre-industrial to being industrial and then communist or socialist society. It's the same unilinear path. Liberal capitalists say all societies or liberal sociology say all societies move from being pre-modern to being modern. Other people say they move from being peasant societies to being mass societies. Other people say they move from being simple societies to being sophisticated societies. In fact, this expresses itself at an individual level. We say that a sophisticated person is a developed person. Think of it, what is sophistication? Or let me make it crude. Does being sophisticated have any expression other than being Western? Does being sophisticated have any expression other than being Western? No. Basically, to be sophisticated is to be Western. It has no either, it has no other iteration. But if you have another idea of what we mean when we say a person is sophisticated other than being Western, tell me. Just raise your hand. I would, I would, I would stop and listen. So the point is that. Modernization theory assumes that all societies have to move in this direction. They have no option. They begin from being simple to being complex societies, from being pre-modern to being modern societies. So they must move in that direction. So what the first generation of leaders in Africa in 1960 up until 1980, what they were doing basically, they were moving us along that unilinear path. They were not doing anything novel. They were basically trying to push us, you know, along that unilinear path. The second assumption of modernization theory is that development, all kinds of development necessarily follow the principles of progress. Development necessarily everywhere follows the principle of progress. What is the principle of progress? In order to get the idea, if you have a notebook in front of you, draw a line, straight line, and then put markers in the line, you know, like in a ruler. And then at the end, you, you draw an arrow so that you show infinity. Here's the point. The idea of progress assumes that you move in that unilinear direction, but in that unilinear direction, there are stages of development. And each successive stage 
necessarily represents an improvement on the previous one. So the idea of development is that all societies move through successive stages where each successive stage represents an improvement on the previous one. And so you can't jump any stage. The assumption here in the idea of progress is that you can't jump any stage. You must necessarily go through all of these stages. <clears throat> now, if you don't get the idea, here it is. It is that if Africa is underdeveloped today and Europe has been developing since the 16th century and has been going through successive stages, it means that Africa, according to the idea of progress, also will have to go through these successive stages. It has no option. And there is no way of jumping these successive stages. It means then that Africa has to repeat what the history of Europe. To be developed, basically Africa has to repeat the history of Europe. If it accepts the assumptions of modernization, which is that all phenomena move through successive stages where each stage, each stage represents an improvement on the previous one. The third assumption of modernization theory is that all societies begin from the same originary moment, which meaning that the starting point is like that in a race. The assumption is that we all start at the same moment of being pre-modern and we're all going to the same ultimate stage of being developed. So we have, we all have the same originary moment or starting point and we all have the same arrival point. The destination is the same. Now here is the point if you have missed it. We don't start from the same originary moment. Other societies were colonized, others were not. So our starting points are not the same. But two, whoever said that the desire for African societies is to be like the West, or the desire in being developed is to land at the same ultimate stage or at the same destination as, well as the West. The problem here is very fundamental. It is that, to give you an example, you see, if any African country today, as every sensible person knows that Coca-Cola and hamburgers kill, if any African country today decided to ban them because it wants to arrive at a different destination for development, you know what it's going to happen? It's going to be called trade a trade war. It's going to be reduced to the practical state. It's a trade war. You've contravened, if you ban McDonald's and Coca-Cola, you've contravened WTO rules. No one is going to allow you pose the question, what does it mean to be developed? It means to be healthy. And what does it mean to be healthy? It is perhaps to have a different food culture. Those questions are foreclosed for us. We don't have an option of raising those questions because of this assumption that we all have the same ultimate stage, destination, we can't basically, as the continent decide on a different development model that has nothing to do with the West. When you try to do so, that possibility is foreclosed for you at a practical state. And so the West hides the fact that there is a higher level of development, which is the conceptual level where we have to think about what does it mean to be developed? When you do anything at that, at a practical state that is informed by a different conceptual level, they basically kill that endeavor at a practical state using practical rules, but which are informed by their own philosophical ruminations about development. Does that make sense? So we are in a mess, basically in the sense that 
we try to resolve development at a practical state. As I've just shown, we for in that we lose sight of the fact that the things we can do at a practical state are already delimited for us at a conceptual level or at a philosophical level. There are things that you already can no longer do. So you can try all you wish, be as morally upright as the leadership and spend all your resources in Africa in a right way, it will not lead to development. It will lead to becoming like the West. And if along the way you realize that actually we could be developed in a different sense, that possibility for you is foreclosed because we are allowed to think about development as the continent only at a practical state, not at a philosophical or conceptual level. I have just a few more points and then I will shut up. Uh, I've been talking for long. So the major problem, the major development problem we have is that we have been dealing with development at a practical state. We haven't engaged at a conceptual level. What would it mean to be developed? Now, the problem is that all these assumptions, and I've only given you three, there are many assumptions of the modernization theory. Because of time, I've only given you three. But all these assumptions are basically abstractions from the concrete history of Europe. Meaning that for Africa, the meaning of development has already been thought out and played out by Europe. All we have to do, or the West generally, all we have to do is to mimic the West in order to be developed. Because these assumptions that I've been talking about are actually abstracted from the real history of Europe. It is Europe that moved from the pre-modern to the modern period. It is Europe that moved from the industrial to the, to, from the pre-industrial to the industrial age. It is Europe that basically went from being simple to complex societies. It is not us, that's not our history. But because we have accepted those conceptual categories, now we think about our societies in those terms. Now we are compelled to repeat the history of Europe because we assume that all societies have to go through those time periods. The ultimate, as I'm saying, is that because these assumptions are abstracted from the history of Europe, it means that for Africa, development has been thought out for us. All we have to do is to mimic the West and to play out again the history of Europe and then we would be developed. Just in case you've missed the point, what Africa misses in the process is its autonomy of thought. It's the ability and the right to say that perhaps to eat hamburgers and to drink Coca-Cola does not amount to being developed. That possibility has been taken away from us. The autonomy of thought, the right to decide what it means to be developed has been taken for us. Now, if this sounds like some crazy idea, there was an attempt by Asian societies, particularly India and the neighboring countries, which in opposition to the UN uh, Human Development Index developed something else, which was called the Happiness Index. This was the attempt basically to say that, wait a moment, you see your human development index that is telling us about, you know, uh, all those things, housing, water, sanitation, and all of those things, you may have all of those, but for us to be developed is basically to be happy. Of course, they developed an index of what it means to be happy. It was not just being happy because we are laughing momentarily. The point is that they attempted to suggest an alternative way of thinking about development. And of course, if you miss the debate, you would see how antagonistic the West was to the happiness index up until it managed to kill it. 
Because basically what it would have meant is that a possibility of thinking about development differently existed. So for us, if the modern world or the developed world is the model or the modular example of development, it means that Africa must remain basically in a state of mimicry. But we know from Timothy Michel that a copy can never become an original. If the aspiration is to be like the West, you can never be the West. Because a copy can never be an original. You would remain basically a replica, meaning that you are going to gain your meaning, your essence. You are never going to have a meaning and essence as Africa outside of the West because you basically have approximated the West. And so you are a copy of the West. The copy always derives its meaning from the original. And so it means that if Africa basically continues to mimic the West, it will remain basically a copy and a copy we know can never become an original. But there's something even more fundamental, which is that the West is not standing still and waiting for Africa to catch up with it. In that line that has infinity with stages, the West is progressing further down the line. That's why we are forever chasing the West. You know, I come from a relatively developed quote and unquote society, which is like the West. That's why I'm saying relatively developed quote and unquote, because I don't think that's the model of development that we should follow. It's called South Africa. It's technologically advanced, but we can't match the West. Here is what has happened. Because classrooms in the West have moved towards becoming uh, what do you call them? Technological classroom where there's no chalkboard. Everyone uses iPads or other gadgets in class to teach. In South Africa, we've also legislated that the classrooms must no longer have chalkboard and everything. Lo and behold, we've had to catch up. Now, here is the problem. The assumption is that if I give you a if I give you a iPad as a grade zero kid or whatever, you are going to have the same relationship with it as a kid in Europe. I've just taken you out in the rural, I'm not even taking you out, you are in the rural areas in South Africa where often there's no network, where often there is no electricity. You've wiped the, the blackboard and replaced it with an iPad. And suddenly you discover that, oh my goodness, sometimes these iPads are not charged just because you were playing catch up with the West. My point is that the West is not waiting, it's progressing. And oftentimes in the bid to catch up with the West, you try to jump some of those successive stages and then it catches up with you. And of course, because we know the political elite is hard at learning, you get stuck with these iPads and the education quality de you know, uh, declines and only years after you say, we made a mistake, uh, it was the kids had not developed to that level of actually trans transitioning, you know, into thinking about knowledge as something that is virtual. They had often thought of the teacher demonstrating with an apple in class and another apple in their eyes. But now because you catapulted them into imagining things virtually, they see an apple on an iPad, they were not ready for it. But because you were playing catch up, you only realize that later that pictorial learning is different from actual empirical examples in class. And then suddenly you are left with an education system that must correct 10, 20 years of a deficiency. I'm making that example to demonstrate the pitfalls of trying to catch up because the West is not waiting. And in a hurry to catch up, you fall into those mistakes. So the last point in my critique, and then I'm going to say something briefly about you know, the post 2000 era. The last point in my critique is that 
In all of this, what we aren't able to ask is, what is the ethic of Western development? Because development is underlined by a certain morality or a certain ethic. So we've never bothered to ask, what is the ethic? And because of time, I'm going to quickly answer the question for you. It is that Western development or development as we know it is underlined by an ethic of domination. Basically, this ethic of domination at other times, it expresses itself as the ethic of advantage, maximizing advantage. This ethic of domination basically is the assumption that the whole environment the whole world is available for domestication for the purposes of profit. Now this ethic of domination basically says that Western development cannot coexist with other models of development. Western development because of this ethic of domination cannot coexist with other models of development that are not in consonance with its logic. So it excludes every other kind of development. It has to be the only. So the result is that because of this ethic of domination, Western development is unable to countenance other models of development. It is unable to coexist with other models of development which may be incompatible with its logic, but are internally coherent and adequate. It does not allow such models. If you want an example, think of traditional medicine in the continent. Everywhere it is under attack from Western medicine. What is Western medicine's concern with traditional medicine? I mean, Western medicine, if it has superiority, it must allow itself, you know, to be superior, but not to go around delegitimizing other forms of healing. But because it can countenance other forms, it actually installs itself as the norm and the standard of development. Western development installs itself and presents itself as the standard as well as the norm. And so for the continent, to accept Western development as the model is to accept our own domination. It is basically to accept and internalize and perpetuate our own domination because of this ethic of domination that is inherent within the Western model of development. One example, and I would be done, I would have been done. It is that, think of it. Today we sit and say we want to be successful. What is the meaning of success? For young people, African people at Northwestern University who are there studying saying they want to be successful, what is the meaning of success? Who gave to them the idea, that idea of success? Did they participate in the crafting of the idea of success? Certainly no. The West sit and say, to be successful is to be like this. And we labor for all our lives, basically, to attain a meaning of success we did not create. And so once you've accepted that model of success or that idea of success, you have accepted your own domination. And so you labor for basically an idea that is not yours, that is not original to you, because you have not participated in a discussion of what may success mean? It's the same thing. So I'm using that example as a parallel. It's the same thing with development. Young people, young African people have accepted a meaning of success. They don't know who invented it. They were not party to it and they labor half their lives or all their lives trying to attain an idea of success that is not theirs. Someone designed that idea of success in order to, of course, advance their own interests. So the more of Western products are included in that idea of success, the West, of course, is guaranteed of a market even outside of Africa. 
I mean, outside of the West. It's the same thing with development. Once we accept that model, it is to accept that ethic of domination that comes with it. So to end off, what has happened to development in Africa post 2000? Or what has happened to development both as a concept and as practice post, post 2000? I think a few things have happened. It is that development now travels the world as though it were devoid of ideology. What has happened post 2000 is that development now travels the world as a concept. It travels the world as though it were devoid of ideology. And so post 2000, no one bothers to stop and say, wait a moment, you say Africa should be developed ideologically, what do you mean? We all sit, you know, in the West here as Africans and say our countries must develop. No one says, wait a moment. When we say we want our countries to become developed, what do we mean? It is because the concept has somewhat been elevated above ideology as if it were devoid of ideology. Two, I suspect that what has happened post 2000 is that because development has become commonsensical, there's been an end to development discourse. And so what you see at a practical level, you see a regime that claims to be progressive or radical, but implementing very liberal policies because development has become commonsensical. So it's eclectic, it's like fashion. You wake up, you know, in the morning you decide, okay, red will go well with navy and white and whatever. You put them together and that's it. That's what development has become. It has become an eclectic. And so there is basically a death, literal death of development discourse. I suspect that we have to return to this discourse in order for us to be able to answer the question in the next talk. I have been long. I am going to stop here. Thank you very much.